It's the early 60s, anime has struggled to find structure and hasn't yet been able to compete with other industries. It simply hasn't been able to make money in its current form. The best works of previous decades have been unprofitable or government funded, which has proven to be a very slippery slope. But a young man named Osamu Tezuka has a dream, to turn anime into a global industry. He rounded up unhappy animators from other studios at the time and started to create Astro Boy, a revolutionary series that would set the template for every TV anime to follow, and establish a business model for anime that hasn't changed in over half a century. You could say that even today, the industry is running because of Tezuka's Astro Boy. Tezuka wanted to break into the TV industry. He saw a far more efficient and feasible future for the medium here instead of at the cinema. And he was right, TV was far cheaper to produce and very profitable, if the right sponsor was found. But there was one problem, anime in its current state was incredibly expensive to produce. It was estimated that for the production of Astro Boy, Tezuka would need 3,000 staff and a budget of about 70 million yen. There wasn't even half that many animators in Japan at the time, and a TV time slot would have never been able to make that money back. But Tezuka adapted and he set about reinventing the wheel. He created a whole new system of anime production. It was called limited animation, and it established production techniques that are still the most efficient in the industry today. Astro Boy started its broadcast on New Year's Day 1963 and marked the start of a new age in anime, and arguably the start of anime as we know it. From here onwards, every year is filled with profitable, large productions of TV anime. But it was called limited animation for a reason. Tezuka was able to fund weekly episodes of his series because he cut corners with production. He used his skills to create a series that would both look good and not str- Let's explore that. When talking about this evolution of anime after Astro Boy, science fiction shows are usually cited as the most important over any other genre. Shows like Space Battleship Yamato were massively popular at this point, which progressed into the colossal mecha boom in the late 70s and early 80s. It's easy to get the impression that science fiction anime for a young male audience was the only important genre at the time, which just isn't true. Massive chunks of the industry were aimed at completely different audiences. Zuyo Ezo were a studio at the forefront of one of these markets. They started the 70s doing contracted work for other studios and then went on to produce a number of popular shows during the first half of the decade. It's where individuals like Hayao Miyazaki, Isao Takahata and Yoshiyuki Tomino got their start, and they would be crucial in a very important artistic movement. The studio began production on the series Heidi, Girl of the Alps, taking inspiration from the early magical girl shows like Sally the Witch. These shows targeted a young female audience instead, which usually means it gets discredited as females didn't buy robot toys to fund their anime, but in truth, they kind of did, just in the form of different merchandising like toy wands. This sector of the market was massively important, and not my as much as it should be. The production of Heidi was a hectic one. Miyazaki has noted many times in the past that Heidi was a far more intricate production than most other anime at the time, some episodes having as much as 8,000 cells of animation, considerably more than most TV anime at the time. It was also possibly one of the first productions since Astro Boy where a critical reception was put on a higher pedestal than financial gain. The creators wanted to make a kids series that was authentic and timeless. The team went the extra mile to make sure Heidi was fully realised, even making trips to Europe for research. Heidi was completed and to an extremely high standard. Miyazaki even discusses how the bar was set to a dangerous high, as most other studios wouldn't even be able to match it. Although Heidi wasn't a financial success, it wasn't a disaster, but this level of production didn't become the standard. What's important is Heidi's reach and critical success. The series was dubbed and spread across the globe, reaching audiences that wouldn't have even heard about anime before. And it proved that there was a market for shows that weren't action oriented. And Heidi achieves a magnificent look with gorgeous painted background, an animation that was far more intricate than most other TV anime at the time. Where Heidi really excels above most of its competition is in its character animation. The way facial expressions and body movements presented here is magnificent. It took a huge amount of skill and was absolutely revelatory. Revolutionary. What was also important about Heidi and the shows that followed was that it established a new time slot in anime. It actually ran alongside Yamato. You think that ratings would drop because of this, but they actually both held very high ratings, meaning that there were two large different audiences watching TV anime now, one interested in science fiction and one more interested in drama. One theory is that sons would watch Yamato with their fathers and daughters would watch Heidi with their mothers. 
Heidi had created a whole new sector of the medium, now known as masterpiece anime. The idea of adapting classic works of literature into anime to tell compelling stories hadn't really been done before, and this was really changing how creators approached anime. Suddenly they could create stories that didn't necessarily rely on fight scenes or space battles, they could put their resources into subtle character animation and melodrama, and actually find a market for this. The success of Heidi proved to be extremely valuable. Zuyo Eizo transformed into Nippon Animation in 1975, bringing a lot of its key staff members and gained a lucrative sponsorship deal with the Drink Calpus, and they started the World Masterpiece Theatre series. The goal was to adapt a classic piece of literature into anime every year, and this spawned some of the medium's most polished and tightly written shows. The first two years were instant classics, with Dog of Flanders in 1975 and 3000 Leagues in Search of Mother in 1976. These shows repeated the critical success of Haiti and found their way overseas. Dog of Flanders continues the style that Heidi established, fantastically atmospheric backgrounds with simple but evocative character designs. What's incredibly powerful about the series was how sad it was. The infamous ending really moved me when I watched it, and I can only imagine how powerful it would have been as a child. Even the town in which it takes place has this slightly melancholic feel to it. For a show aimed at kids, this was very different, and it becomes one of the defining qualities of world masterpiece theatre, that extra level of emotion. The following years had no title sponsor, but were equally packed to the brim with classics like Akagi no An and Swiss Family Robinson. Akagi no An I think can be seen as the peak of world masterpiece theatre. It's the perfect execution of subtlety and story progression. From an animation standpoint as well, Akagi no An really excels especially in the more surreal moments where Anne's imagination leaks into the reality of the story. I've seen very few other series that have created a world and story that so successfully feel real and dynamic. World Masterpiece Theatre carries on until the late 90s, where after 23 seasons it was unfortunately cancelled. Sadly, the younger market had grown up and the new generation of fans just weren't interested. They were more interested in the new wave of battle shown in anime and World Masterpiece Theatre got pushed off the TV. It returned shortly in 2007, but only for a few years. What was astonishing, I think, about World Masterpiece Theatre is how long it ran and how prosperous it was, considering what it was. Even just a handful of these titles would have been a complete gift, but to have so many over the years developing so much talent within the industry, I think we're very lucky. These aren't shows that would have been easy to fund, and the creators working on them would have had to put an enormous amount of effort and time in. The level of meticulous animation and storytelling isn't something that can just be produced on a normal timetable. Creators sacrificed years of their life making these shows so that the medium could have something more impactful, and children could have a greater range of messages to take away from anime. These shows are crucial for how diverse anime is today, and who knows if these other demographics would even exist without World Masterpiece Theatre, especially when looking at studios like Kyoto Animation who thrive off of stories with subtle character moments. Would they exist without shows like Akagi no An? I really don't think so. And who knows if the individuals involved in World Masterpiece Theatre would have been able to flourish without it. Surely Takahata and Miyazaki would find it hard to develop the skills that made Studio Ghibli so unique later on on more mainstream projects. Even creators that didn't necessarily develop into the same style still had their starts here. Toyo Ishida, for example, went on to design some of anime's most iconic character designs, or Yushuyuki Tomino, who went on to change anime completely when he created the Gundam series. World Masterpiece Theatre was crucial in the diversification of anime. Without these shows and the broader market they targeted, anime would have been a drastically different landscape. Like I mentioned, studios like Kyoto Animation create shows that are a product of World Masterpiece Theatre, and I'm sure many of the staff grew up watching them. And it is unfortunate that so few people have watched the series. They're not easy to get a hold of, as DVD releases of them were rare and streaming sites wouldn't go near them due to their lack of loud, shouty protagonists. They've become a kind of lost relic of the community, but I'm not surprised. Most anime fans don't want to sit through 50 episodes of slow, meticulous story development. We're in a world of instantly available episodes and 7 second clips of Sakuga, but I think it is important that people know and understand the influence of things like World Masterpiece Theatre, and respect the individuals who created the medium that we all love today. And I hope this video has done just that, given a good enough understanding of these shows to appreciate their influence. I think it's something that we as a community don't do enough of. And a lot of my videos recently have been focused on spotlighting various aspects of anime to hopefully create a greater general appreciation of the medium. And I'm really enjoying making them and I hope everybody's enjoying watching them. So make sure you are subscribed and following me on social media to keep up with any future projects. There's a lot more coming soon, but for now, why don't you click one of the videos on the screen.